everybody else. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for remaining. So I think we're the, the last panel before the, the showcase of a couple of startups. So uh, my name is Tom Davis. I'm a partner at Microsoft for Startups. Um, and I'm looking forward to introducing or letting the panel introduce themselves. And we're looking to talk a bit like how we see the world of AI from an investor's point of view and what some of the key trends and things that we're seeing. So with no further ado, so why don't we start with Heather? Would you like to introduce yourself, where you work and what you're looking for in the market as well, I think would be a good good point to start. Is this on? No. Great. No? Still on? It's green. Deceptively green. Deceptively green. There we go. There we go. <laughs> all right. We're going to make this work. Uh, well, great to see you all. I was standing out in the cold for a bit, which was sad. Uh, but one of the volunteers rescued me, uh, so that was not sad. Uh, but this is, this is much warmer and, and nicer up here. Uh, and thanks for Majorana for, for hosting this. You guys are so great about just keeping the community rolling. And I feel already that 2024 is off to such a great start. Uh, we are seeing, and I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear from my fellow VCs, but we are already seeing just amazing deal flow in 2024. Uh, I wish I could take all my money from 2023 and redeploy it. <laughs> We're just kidding, 2023 companies. Uh, no, it's uh, it's really going to be a great year. So Heather Redman, I'm one of the co-founders and one of the managing directors at Flying Fish. Uh, we are based here in Seattle. We invest only in AI as seed stage and pre-seed. And uh, we invest um, nationwide, well, I should say, in North America, with a little nod over to the UK, uh, just because we can't resist uh, some of the deals that we get from, from over there. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we started out investing just here in our backyard. We were very humble in our beginnings. We didn't want to sort of say that we knew people outside of the Pacific Northwest, but it turns out we do. And COVID definitely lowered a lot of barriers to location. So we've ended up investing uh, pretty broadly across uh, the US and Canada and uh, love AI, and eventually we'll have to have a thesis that is a little more differentiated than that, since I think everyone will be investing in AI pretty soon. Uh, but we were one of the original um, sort of AI-only firms uh, when we started in 2017, so we stuck to that as our sole thesis, and uh, it's been a blast so far, and we look forward to doing that, at least for the foreseeable future. Great, thank you very much. And next down, Chris. Sure. So it's uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Picardo. I'm a partner of Madrona. I came a very long ways from my upstairs. Um, well done. I didn't have to stand in the cold actually, so that was nice. Um, I just spent a lot of time in my office today. Um, but uh, you know, Madrona is a 30-year-old venture firm, obviously based here. We're immediately above us actually right now. Um, we started in 1994, and we invest really from Series C. You know, as low as basically sometimes sub million dollar checks now to early growth. So think about that as Series B, Series C, up to 25 or 30 million dollar checks at, at the time. So um, you know, we're on our ninth fund now, which is almost a 700 million dollar pool of capital, which is significantly bigger than when I joined the team seven years ago. And so we've certainly scaled. And I think, like Heather was saying, the majority of our portfolio is still in the Pacific Northwest. We're very focused on local companies, especially at the early stage and seed, but we continue to broaden our scope and the types of companies we look at, um, certainly post-COVID and especially in areas we're really excited about. So we definitely, we don't say that we only invest in AI, but I would say that AI is deeply embedded in most of our investments now. Um, and I spend my time on a subset of very funny, unrelated things. So lots of vertical applications, almost all of which are fundamentally involved in AI. One of those vertical applications has turned out to be the intersection of AI and life sciences. Um, so if anyone wants to talk about that, probably not on this panel, I'd be happy to do so. Um, and still poke my head into the consumer world from time to time. And Ryan. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Faber. I'm with Point72 Ventures. Uh, We've invested a little over a billion dollars across two cohorts, entering our third. We are based here in Seattle, not many people know that. We moved up here in 2022. Uh, we invest globally. We have five areas of focus. Enterprise AI, which is where I sit. Consumer, FinTech, Defense Tech, and then more traditional enterprise, which is largely cybersecurity and dev tools. We also have a 
multi-billion dollar growth investing fund that is based here in Seattle as well. So we can go everywhere from pre-seed, which is 750K checks, all the way up to about $100 million at the Series E stage. I sit primarily on the early stage side, though, and largely focused on the infrastructure and application layer of enterprise B2B AI. Fantastic. And just to round off, so Tom Davis, I work for Microsoft for Startups. We don't actually invest um, money. M12, our sister organization, invests money in our VCR. We invest, I say, sweat equity um, in sort of technology for our startups and helping really startups to get through the journey, uh, whether that's go to market, whether that's advice on how to build out your AI infrastructure and things like that. Fortunately, we leverage a lot of knowledge within the company, having built out sort of AI and N365 and various other products. So we try and pass that knowledge on uh, to a lot of our startups uh, uh, that are in the portfolio. And I'll just finish with the final plug of the fact you can get free open AI if you come to Microsoft for startups. So <laughs> come along and we'll give you the credit for it. Uh, so, can you uh, get GPT-5? Uh, <laughs> we will do. You will get privileged access to GPT-5 before everybody else. That's one of the things we do offer our startups that come into the program. But enough about that. Um, I'm maybe slightly older than some of the people here, maybe roughly the same age as some of the other people here. I can remember this, when we were talking about the internet a few years ago, and it suddenly came on end of the 90s and stuff like that, it was, it was crazy, everyone went crazy, but we weren't talking about investing, well, very quickly we stopped talking about investing in internet companies. Internet is everywhere, in everything you do. You know? Are we at the same point? Are we going to be at that? point soon with AI? I'll start at the top, please tell me. Uh, it's hard to say when we will be at that point, but, but we certainly feel like we're on that ride. Uh, and I, I think of it more like cloud as opposed to internet, uh, honestly. And I think it's going to be different for different industries. So a couple of different things or different observations. One, one I would say, you know, just from our own experience of starting out in 2017 as a, as a firm, when we started out, we were talking to institutional LPs about our firm, and we were saying, hey, we have a thesis of only AI. They, they said to us, and, and I quote this back to some of those same LPs today, um, that that was too niche and wasn't investable. And how are we going to find any companies that were doing AI? You know, that was just, what, what are you thinking? And um, you know, now, of course, they're like, well, that's too broad. Uh, you need a narrower thesis. You, know, or you concentrate on something more you know, How dare you? exact <laughs> in AI. You know, and that's, you know, what, seven years ago. And, and so um, it's happening very fast that AI is becoming, at least in the investment community, very much table stakes. And, and I think we saw this before in cloud, at least with respect to a certain cohort of industries and companies. Um, and I think with a certain <coughs> mindset of the investment community. But if you also think about it, and, and I, talk, I give a lot of talks to boards of directors in all different industries who are dying to know about AI, of course, and what should we do, and are we early, are we late, or we, should we be more scared or, or, more, or, or more green? And, and some of them are in the industrial sector, for example, which is a sector that we are very interested in from an investment perspective. And for those companies, I say, hey, look, the internet, for example, and even computers, didn't touch your basic operations that much. Yeah. AI, if it goes the way that we think it is going, is going to touch it. So the Industrial Revolution was the last thing that really upended your whole business because you were doing it with like little picks and shovels, and then you got to bring in machines. and None of you were alive when that happened, you yeah. know? And so this is this really transformative technology for a whole part of the economy that might have skipped the last couple, you know, second or third industrial revolutions. And those are really big parts of the economy. And so there are some just very fundamental things that haven't even yet begun to be scratched by AI, but when they get scratched by AI, will really be transformed if it goes the way that we think it will go. And I try to be very humble about it going the way that we think it will go because we've all experienced those, you know, hype cycles, right? And we want to be 
cognizant of that, and we don't want to predict that it's all going to be wow, 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 up and to the right. Um, but from what we see today, we think there are some really fundamental trans transformations that are going to occur in the old bread and butter stuff that we're all used to, to dealing with our technology companies and all the sectors that have been you know, disrupted every 10 years or something, but also in some areas of the economy and human life, for that matter, that we haven't really had disrupted and turned upside down in our lifetimes. Um, and so for that reason, I'm like, yeah, it's not really like the internet in the 90s. And certainly not like pets.com, you know, which, which I lived through. Um, it's just investing in something like yeah. that. <laughs> Chris, what do you see? Well, I think it's an interesting comparison that I think is a fun one to make, but probably doesn't hold on all the same sort of dimensions. I think you know, Heather, I don't disagree with anything that she said. I think the internet, you know, was the biggest distribution platform that anybody had ever built. Um, and it was just incredibly underestimated, and frankly, probably still is underestimated. Um, and I don't see AI as that right now. Um, and but partially that's because I don't think we know. I mean, we're really like a year and a half into, you know, this sort of wave of the cycle. And so people are still really figuring out what is actually useful. What are the outputs? Like, what should AI do? And so I, I think about it more as like a somewhat ill-defined category of incredible tools that people are going to put to work in ways that we don't really predict. And so I think the similarity with the internet is this constant underestimation of sort of the scale of distribution on the internet side is probably going to mirror constant underestimation of the types of things that these tools can do. But I don't know that, you know, uh, the thing I'm a little skeptical about is whether it's as platformy as the internet where you could say, hey, you know, Facebook's going to connect 2 million people, right, in a way that never happened because of the power of this distribution. I think it's just hard to say that, that, that we're at that point. But certainly from a power perspective of lots of untapped possibilities, I think there's sort of an interesting comparison. Anyway. Nice, nice. Ryan? Uh, I agree with everything that was said here. I would I would add something uh, that was said in an earlier panel, which is that generative AI specifically has the potential to take a tool that is kind of one size fits all and make it extremely personal. And that's kind of the opposite effect that the internet had, which is taking one thing and distributing it widely. It's taking that widely distributed thing and making it extremely personal to what you do. So I think we're seeing that mature very quickly and we're getting to value much more quickly than we were in the 90s uh, when it comes to like internet companies that spring up very quickly and collapse very quickly. So as we see very smart people start working with the infrastructure and application layer tools that we're starting to see evolve, the ROI to businesses has become clear, I think, pretty quickly. Look at GitHub Copilot as a great example. I mean, there are reports even as of early last year that showed the impact of using GitHub Copilot increased engineering productivity by some huge number. I'm going to get it wrong. It was like 50 or 100x. Um, and I'm not sure that we necessarily saw that dynamic take place quite so clearly when we are talking about the early ages of the internet. I do agree that in both cases, we're pretty much underestimating the, the capabilities. But I think now we're starting to see glimmers of what AI can do across a pretty wide variety of uh, use cases. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I've heard it very often. People talk about AI like electricity. It's uh, sort of, we get this light bulb moment, which is probably ChatGPT, and the whole world goes, ooh, you can do something like that. And then creativity takes over and innovation takes over, which is exactly what the startup ecosystem is here for, because you can move so much faster and bring out more solutions and things as well. Some will stick, some won't. Let's see what's going to happen there. But I think we touched on it a minute ago as well. There's so much going on with this. How on earth, Chris, as an investor, do you navigate this market? I mean, we've all seen on LinkedIn, these are the top 10 legal AI companies. I mean, every day we were getting these sort of logos thrown at us, and half those companies probably don't exist anymore, and all this other type of stuff. As a company, how do you navigate this? It's a good question. I mean, from the investor perspective, I mean, we've had to meet with so many more companies, I think. Uh, in some of these spaces. And part of that is just the barrier to entry to creating a vertical solution has gone down to basically zero. Um, I'm not a particular, particularly technical person, but you could probably like ask me to mess around and figure out some sort of AI vertical application and come up with something that would really sound authoritative, uh, even if it was bad. And I think so, I think you've got this interesting 
uh, combination of factors are the barrier to entry for some of these industries. And I think about what Heather was saying about all these industries that skipped the internet and cloud and SaaS and any type of modern tool. The barrier to entry to get to them is actually quite a bit lower. Um, I think that means that the barrier to articulating sort of your product and you know what customer problems you're solving is quite a bit higher. Um, and so if you're the you know 17th company that says, hey, we're going to parse a legal document, well, everybody else can parse a legal document. So what are you going to do? Um, and I think that question has become more important. Whereas you probably would have seen with some of these AI companies pre ChatGPT. Um, that it was, the questions were a little bit more about the technical side and like what are you building and what's the uniqueness of your model and all of that. Some of that's been blown up. And so it's actually interestingly, and I think in a good way, has to focus teams towards like you have to solve a real customer problem with a product that resonates with them. That is really the only way to make money, I think, broadly in business. Um, and you have the luxury of having a technology stack that makes it easier for you to do at any time in history. But it also means everybody else can do it too. And so you have to be more ruthless about what you're solving and why that's uh, you know, uniquely uh, suitable to sort of your customer set. Um, so tons of opportunity. I think the bar, though, for what you're actually building and why has gone up a ton. Yeah, and Ryan, I mean, you're looking at things at a global level, at the size of the company and things. So how does that factor in? Is the West Coast US far more ahead than the German ecosystem or anything like that? And how do you navigate through the needs of different customers around the world to really find that right investment? So the way that we invest is very thematic. We do very little inbound. A lot of it is outbound because we spend a good six months going very deep on specific topics. And that allows us to build a network before we even have the first conversation with a founder. So we're talking to researchers. We're talking to uh, potential customers in the operating side of things. Um, and that thesis development stage is actually very important to allow us to understand what we think the problem is that is the most valuable to solve. And I guess to your point about being global, the, the opportunity is different across you know, every region we invest in. So companies that, in Germany, for example, might have very good relationships with manufacturing businesses. And we've seen some incredible computer vision and manufacturing companies scale out of Germany. And that's because there's a talent base coming both from the research side and the operating side there who understand that problem statement really well. And because we are spending that amount of time, you know, literally outbounding to researchers at universities in Germany or Israel or, or the UK or, or Stanford, um, we can understand where those pockets of talent are and then actually leverage those conversations in the diligence sessions that we have with companies. So when it comes to actually identifying teams that are solving problems in a way that aligns with us, we actually go back to the people we talk to and say, hey, researcher from X Institute, we just met this company. Do you want to have a conversation with them and, and see what they're building, how it resonates with you? Um, and in doing that, we we can sift a little bit through the noise, although I will completely agree that we're talking to probably three or four times the number of companies in any given vertical than we probably would have, you know, pre chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. And Heather, do you have first mover advantage? Do you know all the tricks, what works, what doesn't work? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I've already got all the big companies. It's too late, you guys. Um, no, I mean, it's very hard. I, I would say that you know, everyone's like, wow, you must be having so much fun investing in AI. And I'm like, oh my god, it's so hard because of this problem. Uh, everything is moving so fast. The sands are shifting constantly. Competitive advantage of moats are very hard to define. Um, it's a tough time for entrepreneurs, it's a tough time for VCs, for us. Um, but it is, um, I, I'd say one of the things that we are finding is we are um, spending more time on the picks and shovels. So, you know, as all this AI is, is developing, we're seeing that there is more need for infrastructure, more need for the tools for the developers of the AI. And so more concentration on those aspects of, of investment opportunities are, are coming to the fore. We're seeing some amazing things there, particularly in the area of enterprises are very hungry now to deploy AI. So how do you make that easier for them to do? Um, and they have lots of issues with how do they deploy AI. So you know, how do you sort of make that simpler for them to do or safer for them to do or more palatable in, in any variety of ways. Um, and, and I also think that the vertical applications, as you know, as my co-panelists have said, 
um, you know, really concentrating, since we are seed and pre seed investors, really concentrating on the quality of the team, the differentiated domain expertise, the data advantage to the extent that they have it, and we're talking about some of these um, sectors that may have been previously untouched by some of the technology waves. If you can find someone that has that, that domain expertise and a data advantage of some sort, certainly not a data moat because there's lots of you know, publicly available data out there, but some sort of a data advantage or a data lead, that is super helpful. But really trying to find out what's that leg up but then I also really agree with Chris that it's going to be about business execution and focus on the customer because this is not technology for technology's sake at this point. It's really got to be deployed for a business objective. Um, and, and that is hard to do. Uh, and always has been hard to do. But I think it's particularly hard with AI because you have a lot of barriers. Um, not only does the product take longer to really get useful and has and it's never 100% you know, it's it's statistically decent and maybe great, but not 100%. Um, but it also takes time to fine tune. And then there's all of this sort of emotional baggage and societal baggage and regulatory baggage kind of hanging over it too, right? So you have a lot of sort of customer issues that you have to work through in the sales cycle and then in the adoption cycle as well. And so that's a lot for an investor to sort of underwrite as you're going through the, uh, the process of making your decision. Great. So Ryan, I'd love to know, who is the one company in the portfolio that you're really excited about that's going to be successful in AI? <laughs> uh, so every company in our portfolio is involved in AI, so maybe instead of saying the one that I'm most excited about, I'll say the most recent one that we made an investment in that's public that I'm also very excited about. Um, they, are, they actually spun out of AI too. They're called Spiffy AI. Uh, it's led by a really incredible technical team, but um, I think what sets them apart is that they do have that domain expertise that you mentioned, which is, you know, the CEO was leading the LLM initiatives at Walmart. Uh, the CTO as a professor from UCSD who's been studying AI for his entire career. And the chief scientists and chief research officers have been um, at the very forefront of large language models since inception. One of them was on the original Elmo paper, which kind of was the forefather of large language models as we know them. What they're actually doing is quite interesting. They're using that kind of domain expertise in the retail space to build infrastructure that allows retailers to hyper-customize every customer experience across channels. So y you could think about it like a personalized large language model. That's not exactly the right term because it's not a large language model. They call it an outcome-oriented model. So what they're doing is aligning with businesses on the desired outcomes, if it's reducing churn or increasing click-through rate or pushing customers towards certain purchases or just getting to know customers better. It can align those personalized models with those outcomes and then tailor every single interaction across websites and email and other marketing campaigns to that goal at a very personal level. And I think that kind of speaks to the point that I made earlier, which is that we're taking these tools like marketing and UI UX that have been for so long kind of a way of doing one thing for many people the same way, and we're flipping it on its head and doing this very broad thing in a very personal way for one person in a way that really resonates with them. I think it's fantastic, because I think one of the big challenges that everybody sees in the ecosystem is great tech doesn't sell on its own. You, and they're coming at it with a real business case, they've got the domain expertise, which isn't always as common as we would expect in, the, in this industry. So, Chris, what about yourself? I'm gonna take uh, Ryan's lead and just not answer the question. <laughs> um, but I will say, I'll, I'll say two things. One, you know, I think on this vertical theme, the most recent investment I made, which I would actually not consider, by the way, an AI investment, but I would consider an investment that is using AI, because of course you should for this problem, um, is a company focused on helping people buy professional liability insurance which has to be the most boring category that anybody is going to talk about today. Uh, and it's also like a $50 billion category that has been done on paper. And it's mostly language related. So it turns out like you've got a bunch of loose, unstructured language, like what should you use? A large language model. Um, do they pitch themselves as AI? Not really. They pitch themselves as we're solving your problem, right, of speed, price, risk coverage in a much more modern way. And otherwise, you've got to pick up the phone, call a person, and it will take you like eight weeks to get anything back. So, I'm pretty excited about that one. It was also the most recent. Um, 
And, I, and again, I wouldn't call it an AI company, but I would call it a company that could not be built in the form that it's being built without using AI. Um, I'll say the thing that we're not investing in, which is not the question you asked, but it's sort of the inverse, um, is we haven't made an investment in a model company. So we, we have not you know, been involved in any of the companies that are trying to build and train their own custom models, I think for a variety of reasons. One, I think, frankly, right, the Microsofts of the world are the ones who are probably going to play that game. And two, the open source side of that world, right, is going to scale incredibly quickly, and you'll have your choice of which type of model and infrastructure you want to use. So I think early on, when everybody was certainly getting excited about those types of investments, that, you know, we didn't make any. And, um, that's still a space that we're probably not looking as much. Um, so we're not so far in the fix and shovels layer as down to the actual models. You know, I get blown away by something. Um, but, you know, I think uh, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not, but that's not actually something that, that we've done or have really been focused on in the last year. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's very sensible. It's, uh, <laughs> there's only gonna, I think the common thinking now is that there's only going to be a few large language model people out there because you haven't got enough money or GPUs. Well, I will come to questions in a second. Um, so, Heather, you must have a ton of great examples because you've seen a bit of maturity in some of your investments, I'd imagine, as well. So I'm eager to hear. Yeah, I was trying to think of a fun one for, for this group, and I, I think I'm going to pick on just sort of my favorite sector because I, in between my two tech careers, and you get to a certain age, and you're like, how many careers have I had and how can I sandwich them? But, but I had this energy career in between my two tech careers. So one of my favorite things to do, and it's one of the, the themes that we look at at Flying Fish, is to look at the energy transition as it intersects with AI. Um, because it's a huge, important um, sector, and there's a lot going on there. It also happens to be a very hot sector from an investment standpoint. So if you can do AI plus energy transition, or climate tech, as some people like to think of it, you get like sort of, you know, this incredible sort of explosion of investor interest and wonderfulness. Um, so we've done a few investments in that area, and the most recent one that we did is still a very stealthy company, but they are using reinforcement learning um, to tackle water um, uh, um, processing. So both on the um, drinking water side, but also the wastewater side. And we have another company in our portfolio that does the same thing on energy conservation. So we are applying that same sort of technology, but on the water side. And they're all sort of ex defined people. We have a real network of, of that sort of founder group. And it's really great to see them watching each other and sort of seeing the success of applying very hardcore reinforcement learning in you know, what's really a black box and getting great results in reducing energy expenditures in very complex systems and then porting that over to the water context, which is, I think, the next frontier after energy and starting to experiment with how do you make water processing more efficient um, and because you know, there's a lot of inputs to that, right? And a lot of waste in how we deal with our water systems today. And these folks are just rocket scientists, um, or I guess I should say AI scientists with a, with a high degree of interest in water. Um, very motivated, which is one of the things we notice about AI folks is that the best of them tend to be motivated by really almost two things, <coughs> solving sort of big healthcare issues and solving big climate issues. And those are the things they really want to work on. So if you can find things that are commercially relevant or VVCs can make a lot of money that fall into one of those two categories, Chris is also interested in this, they make great founders. And so this water use case has been really exciting for us. And we're, we're really hoping for great things from this group. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think this fact that AI, as we said, is going to be sort of broader than the internet, and it's going to disrupt these industries or areas of industries that we haven't been able to touch until today, and now it's sort of more accessible to people that are using it. So, as I promised, I'll open up for a few questions. We had a first question over here, the gentleman in the red shirt. We have time for just one. Just one question, apparently. Uh, yeah, Tom, I think, uh, I think this concerns you as well, because you're Microsoft and by association OpenAI. 
Um, and <laughs> Heather, like, in the room, yeah, just Heather I, I, I love your passion around uh, how to kind of look at wrapper technology versus the fundamental AI models and when you are investing, uh, what is your kind of mental model in terms of wrapper technology versus uh, fundamental models? So I'll just repeat that for everybody. What is the, the core of the question is, how do we look at from an investor's point of view the difference between wrapper technology and core technologies in making investment decisions? Yeah, I would say for us, we, we don't do a lot of wrapper um, companies. We tend to, like the, com uh, the um, generative investments we've made have mostly been out of the language context and more in either the life sciences context where they actually are doing a lot of proprietary data and fine tuning and in a molecular environment or in the material science context. So out of the language area altogether, where there is a lot of proprietary um, fine tuning of the model and a, and a pretty big moat, um, and and so that is where we would be more likely to play. Um, and the core technology that we'd be looking for in another sort of language oriented environment would be pretty far out of a wrapper context. So the wrapper companies don't tend to make it past our initial screen. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that generally speaking, a lot of the wrappers have been prototyping tools, and they've been really, really good at that. And obviously, you can look at companies like Langchain, which I consider right, largely a lab wrapper that's been good at that, and also more. But um, there's a huge need in the market to allow people to experiment quickly. When you move stuff into production, you tend to not use the wrapper type approaches. And so I would agree with Heather that we mostly aren't looking at that. Um, you know, from the kind of like what's going on in the underlying level. Um, I mean, I think the, you know, if we as a group of people who think about AI think that transformers are the end as an architecture, then we'll have made a pretty big mistake. And so I think if you think about where models are going, I think the interesting thing that frankly I'll say like admittedly we haven't really seen, although there's been some papers on it, is like what's past transformer architecture. Um, and so I think if you see investments get made at the underlying technology level, it's not going to be because somebody's going to put a billion dollars into training the next transformer model. It's going to be because somebody invented, right, or has been improving on an architecture that has similar performance and that is moving past that. Um, and so, you know, my sense is wrappers are probably largely going to be relegated to prototyping for a while. And, you know, maybe his last words could all be wrong in some of the scale. Um, and that if people are looking at the underlying technology layer, it will be because of, you know, new, completely new architectures. Uh, just quickly, I'll say, it kind of depends on what you mean by wrapper, because there are plenty of companies that we have looked at and gotten really excited about that are just calling another model, but they're doing something with that output that is very interesting. And that's kind of what we, I think, all mean when we say domain expertise is really important. Because I actually don't, in some cases, really care what model you're using as long as it's you know the highest performing one. Maybe it's GPT-4, maybe it's Mistral's most recent model. And you could call that a wrapper, but it's using that output in a domain setting that solves a problem that only you have real <coughs> insight into. Uh, that's what gets us excited. Um, you know, as an example, I, I, there are plenty of very successful recent companies in the legal tech space. We've invested in one in, with Madrona called Lexion that is not building a model from scratch. They are wrapping a very sophisticated technology around that model using their domain expertise in the legal sector. So I, I think maybe we all are defining wrapper a little bit differently, but it, it's, a, it's an interesting question that I think everyone's struggling with. Yeah, I think that's in general. The basic principles of investing haven't been thrown out the window because of AI. It's a, are you resolving a customer problem? What is your defendable moat? And what's your domain expertise, the quality of the founders and the techno technology team? So at the end, it's still valid. AI is just another area to do that. I would love to, but I've been told I'm not allowed to. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.